the Sackler Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication, where scientists and communication professionals come together to write a better future for communicating science. All right, so we're now going to hear from a couple of pros in the business world who have been using social science research for decades to better understand their customers and thus be more successful in business. They're looking to share of wallet while well, we're, we're looking for share of mind. So we think that we can learn a lot from them and I'd like to welcome Davis Mastin and Peter Zandon. Davis has spent more than 30 years building Cheskin, a design consulting company focused on youth culture, branding, trust, and product development. And Peter is the global vice chair at Hill Knowlton Strategies, a leading communications firm with 90 offices in 52 countries. Together, they're gonna use their decades of research and experience to apply lessons from business to the challenges of science communication. I'm going to return after their talk to field questions from the audience. So, fellas, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, when when uh, Davis and I first started talking about this, and then we, we uh, started talking with Barbara, Klein Pope, um, we knew what we'd be talking about would be controversial to this audience. Uh, but we were told they want thinking out of the box, and so this is what we're here to deliver to you. It's been fascinating listening to the discussion over the last couple of days because Davis and I come from a very different perspective. We come from that marketing perspective um, that I know a lot of you don't necessarily subscribe to. Um, as Kara said, We've had, you know, each of us probably 20, 30 years of experience working with companies, working with organizations to communicate their messages better, to reach audiences and to be heard. Uh, at the same time, both Davis and I, I think this is why we're invited here, we're also engaged in the scientific community. Davis has been uh, engaged in the president circle for the past 10 years here at the National Academies. Uh, I've recently joined the uh, president circle and I've been chairman of Earth Sky, I don't know communications, if you've heard of that, uh, over the past 20 years. So I think I understand some of the issues uh, that you're addressing, but again, our, our knowledge and our expertise comes from the business world. So there are the... Uh, Shake clicker. Got it. So this hopefully gives you our understanding <laughs> of your skepticism of the marketing world. Uh, we get it. We get the fact that if you say you're, you know, you you do public relations or marketing or message development, that you're going to get the scientific community very uncomfortable. I have gotten them so uncomfortable that they have left the room in a committee uh, on climate choices, an atmospheric chemist actually got up and left the room because I started talking about audiences and messages. So I get it, we get, we get the problem. Um, that said, um, we want to talk a little bit about our knowledge and, and what we we bring to this discussion. Davis. So uh, I learned long ago that it's good to tell an audience where you're trying to take them. And then you can judge from that uh, how we did and whether or not it's going to be relevant. You can shoot holes, ask better questions along the way. So I've got three observations, and Peter's going to talk a little bit about a framework that hopefully will be useful for you. And that, um, so my observation first, uh, we're being outmaneuvered. Um, uh, the, the tools of marketing, the, um, uh, that the science world is not standing up to uh, the, the, the forces that are out there. And we're advocating change. We're not at all convinced exactly how to do it, but um, uh, the outmaneuvering is only going to increase. Uh, we see reasons for hope, uh, and we'll outline those uh, in a minute. But essentially, we're outmaneuvered. Things need to change, but there's reason for hope. All right, now I'm going to talk a bit about a framework, and, and it's a framework from business. And if you notice, when we introduced the session, it, there was a question mark there, lessons from business, question mark, in that we are respectful of the challenges that you have versus the business world. But I think there's some lessons there because, and you'll see I've got a money slide coming up, which talks about how much money businesses invest in communications to make sure they're effective. 
But you know, from doing this in our, our discussions about what, how the business community is dealing with communications, we came up with this framework, and I think it's very applicable. Uh, let me go through it real quick, and I'll talk you through it as, as we move through the presentation. But the first one is metrics, which should not be foreign to you at all. But this infatuation with big data, with measuring things in business, has truly taken hold. Everything that moves is being measured. And it is part of that framework, and you have the same opportunity. The second one, and I was pleased to hear today more and more discussion about engagement. Because the business world has embraced the term engagement as a way to express what they're trying to do when they communicate. 10, 15 years ago, it was about sales, it was about transaction. It is now about engagement, getting people involved in what they're trying to accomplish. And third and not, not least, um, and I know it's a toxic word almost in a, uh, an audience like this, is ROI. But what's interesting is businesses are no longer looking at ROI strictly as a financial uh, uh, measurement. It's being defined differently. It is what are you trying to accomplish? It's, it was like the last panel saying, what are the goals and what do we need to invest, whether that's money, time, resources, and are we getting a return for that? And the reason they're doing that is not, I mean, obviously the financial calculation is really important, but it is to make sure they're being effective. And, and let me repeat that, it, that ROI really is an accountability effectiveness measure more than a financial measure. So Davis. I'd, I'd like to take a step back though, just uh, being in this auditorium, about, oh, it was last October, October 24th, actually. I was about 250 feet over here. Um, and I, I had the flu, you know, you're at a meeting and you're not feeling so good, so you're gonna go home early and all of that. Well, I asked somebody to help me with the flight and help me uh, get, get a cab. I mean, all the normal stuff. I really wasn't feeling well. Usually I just do it on my own. And um, uh, so the person came up, a few minutes uh, later and said, uh, I'm thinking, oh, the cab's here, great. Um, and she said, uh, security's on the way with the wheelchair, the ambulance is almost here. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I, I, uh, that night at Georgetown University Hospital, uh, they read me last rites, right? So I'm here, uh, not only because of the president's circle and this, that, and the other thing, but, but, but I'm here because science has saved my life. I, I don't mean, and the NAS, frankly, there are two women, uh, Sandy Fitzpatrick and Barbara Shaw, who uh, um, essentially ordered me to go. And unusually, when somebody ordered me, I actually went. Uh, and um, uh, that, that's one thing. And then second is the, the, the techniques and tools of the science that they did with two brain surgeries and 31 days in ICU. They didn't exist 10 years ago. So if, if the message is coming across and it's making you feel a little uncomfortable that there are a couple of schlockmeisters up here, um, okay, I mean, your instincts aren't all bad. <laughs> however, however, we get that it's an important, uh, that, that science and technology is important uh, for the world. And that's the last thing we want to do, uh, is to tamper it. And, and along those lines, that, that um, this freight train, science is moving like a freight train. Um, it's something people look at, and they go, oh, freight train, and I'm going to go on to do other things. Uh, a scientist will look at that um, and say, oh, well, in my specialty, I'm going to work papers, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Every one of those... Uh, uh, cars may be a different specialty, and mine relates to this, and, and, uh, and it may relate to these other things, but there's, there's this large thing that the public really doesn't understand that's only so appealing uh, that's part of their lives. And, and we're looking to say, well, how can we actively engage? Um, so. Right, so uh, usually when I look at a problem, and this, again, this is my background, I, I take a look at the money. And I was curious, I was curious about saying, well, how much does business spend on communications? And I wanted to scale that with how much is being spent on science communications. And this is, you know, rough numbers, it's hard to actually come to be very specific, but it's interesting that businesses are spending now over a trillion dollars a year getting their message out. 
And that's everything from TV advertising to in-store promotion to mass advertising. It's interesting, if you break that down, uh, you get about $500 billion in targeted marketing, reaching individuals. That's the one that's growing, and it's getting much more effective. We're able to find those numbers. Uh, we searched everywhere uh, and, and tried to kind of do a bottoms-up estimate on science communication. Uh, we couldn't get there, and we had some discussions with experts, but we know it's less than a billion dollars. So if you look at that kind of order of magnitude of difference, you can see why Davis starts out saying, outmaneuvered. This group has a lot of money, and it's spending on communications to be heard. And that is part of the com competition to be heard are these messages. But I want to take it a step further, because I think this is really the most interesting and ironical part of the presentation. Uh, businesses are spending $9.5 billion a year to research the effectiveness of their messages. Let me repeat that, nine and a half billion dollars a year on marketing research to understand their effectiveness. Now, if you take what they research and how much you spend, it's fascinating because you know where we got those techniques? Social scientists. We're using the techniques that labs, universities, uh, institutes developed and we use them every day, and businesses have bought into things that you've developed. And so I think it's absolutely fascinating that your work has been adopted. It's been acted on. But when we do work with the scientific community, the science community, we do not find the resources or even the appetite to use some of these techniques that you've developed. So how many of you saw this New York Times Magazine uh, article uh, a while back, uh, uh, is selling a president uh, any different uh, from selling a pizza? So, it, um, well, um, um, to, to be provocative, is selling science any different than selling a pizza? Well, hell yes it is. There, there are issues of integrity and trust that uh, about science that that are um, uh, that, that that are are key. Science will go away. It won't have impact if it doesn't um, have trust. But there are things to be learned from um, uh, from selling pizza. So one thing that 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 we all know the science community has that uh, is not embedded in the pizza people, if you will. Go to the next line. Is that um, uh, I mean every school child. Uh, we had the opportunity to talk with them at the, the university level. There are over 20 million uh, students in the U.S. Um, uh, that uh, there are almost a billion people uh, going to museums. And generally, I mean, there are a lot of different statistics on this, but, the, but generally, scientists still have the, the trust of the public. Peter? So what is changing? Because I, I do think that the model I presented earlier about metrics, engagement, and ROI, there's something that's changed in our society, and we're going through that radical change, and it's social media. And if you do look at numbers and you say, okay, how many people read the New York Times? Well, on a good day, it's a million people, uh, on a very good day. But if you look at Facebook or LinkedIn or some of the other emerging, and again, they're just emerging social media, you've actually got tens if not hundreds of million people engaged. And what's powerful about this is not only that engagement that people are on these platforms, but what's more importantly is there's data from these platforms. You can see where people go, you can see what they do, you can see if they open a video, they can see if you watch a video, you can see if you abandon a video. And so because they're moving their world onto this platform, the business world is going to have more, is, does now, and continue to have more data than ever before. And so they can start looking at engagement rather than transactions and the return on their investment. So the effectiveness that these platforms have provided is truly transforming communications for business. So one of the, one of the things, uh, um, there's a, a friend of mine, a world-class scientist, um, I'm not gonna mention uh, his or her name here, uh, but that uh, he was very excited one day. Uh, we were talking about communications and 
on uh, his discovery, uh, he had gotten some communication money to really uh, uh, break through. Uh, and uh, he was very excited. I mean, just like really excited. Uh, and, and I said, well, great. So uh, how much? Uh, and he said, I, I've been given $600,000 to, to change how America thinks about this. I'm going to introduce the idea, and I'm going to change their minds. And I looked at him, and I said, now he's a very good friend of mine, and uh, I just said, so help me, help me, help me. As a scientist, you've, you've been based, all of your work has been based on in integrity. All of your work has been about discovering truth. How can you let your naivete around communications of what it costs lead you to believe that you're going to be anything, anything but noticed, if you're lucky, uh, as a headline? That um, in, in his, or, or, or to go back to the freight train, it's just a, a, a freight train passing in the night. So our, our challenge around uh, um, uh, to, to the audience, and, and we're about done. We'd like to, to open this up to Q&A. Um, we're, we're being outmaneuvered. There's big changes needed. We see reason for hope that we're happy to deal with in the, in the Q&A. And, uh, and Peter's presented a framework at, at least about how we think about it. All right, great. So it's now time, right? We're ready? Okay, <laughs> to hear from you guys. Um, so again, remember to submit your questions via email. You can submit them to sacklerwebcast at nas.edu, or you can tweet them using the hashtag Twitter. And before we open up to you, I actually wanted to start with some comments and questions that I've been noticing following the Sackler hashtag here. I have one here from Lawrence Swader, who I think is in our audience, but this is echoed by a lot of individuals. It says, we're science communicators being outmaneuvered by commercial communicators. That is exactly right. So my question for you guys is, how do you see science communication scaling up when, when we, we remember that slide that showed a trillion dollars plus being poured into commercial interests and less than a billion dollars being put into science communication? How, how do you foresee science communication being scaled up to compete? So I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, let me tell you a little story. Um, um, so the meeting I was in uh, where I got so sick uh, was the Earth and Life Studies Division. I, I sat on the advisory committee to Dell's, as it's known here, uh, for six years. And I, I chaired the communication subcommittee. So I got, the, to, to, I got very familiar with the communications issues around climate and water and oceans and life sciences and a, and a variety of things. And I learned so much from other committee members that um, uh, one of the things we, we, I learned that I knew very little about was citizen science. And I asked the question uh, to the executive director at that time, are we ready for 100 million people to do uh, uh, science with their cell phones? Just kind of a naive, playful thing. Well, and as I think we all know, you've got to be careful about what question you ask, because you may have to answer it some. So in, in this regard, there was a small little uh, task force subcommittee um, of esteemed uh, 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 scientists uh, who, who looked at this. Uh, it's by no means a, a committee report, by no means anything that's officially done by the National Research Council. It's more of a curiosity frame of reference issue. But the, generally came back and said, yes, there, there were reason to believe why uh, 100 million people is not a stretch goal. Um, well, I, I was explaining this to, to um, uh, to Erwin Jacobs, who's another president Sirwood, uh, circle member. Some of you may know Erwin. Uh, uh, he was the chair of the, um, uh, the National Academy of Engineering uh, and uh, co-founded Qualcomm. So I said, well, Erwin, well, um, uh, I, I told him this little story, and, and, uh, and he said, so why are you thinking it's so small? <laughs> and I went, oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, he goes, Davis, you need to understand that, that there's so much computing power and so many sensors and so much interconnectivity for, and, and billions of people, you know, there'll, there'll be five billion people with smartphones and, uh, and, and infrastructure that barely resembles what we have today and that'll be in 2017. 
You know, the average city in, uh, in um, now uh, has a billion sensors in it. It'll have 10 billion by 2020. And, and so I, I think the opportunity that I see in response to your, in, to your question is looking at what uh, Irwin had counseled me um, uh, or challenged me with. Well, how can, how can we be relevant to people? How can science be relevant to people uh, in the choices that they make every day? I, I think that that kind of power and connectivity is soon to be with us. And I happen to believe that it is this audience, the science communicators, working with designers and business modelers and others, but it's the science communicators that are going to help bridge that interface uh, and make that possibility a reality. But for the cynics out there, we do have a question that came in um, from those who are uh, participating remotely that says, you know, I looked at the comparison of the amount of spending on business marketing versus SciComm. Who's going to pay for SciComm? Where's that money going to come from if we want to find balance? Yeah, good. It's a hard question. I mean, he's going to do that one. <laughs> um, and bear with me. Uh, what businesses are seeing is the transformation of communication. What's amazing is it now no longer costs $100 million to move the American public because you do have platforms like social media. So if you, you look in the rearview mirror and you say, how do you compete in, an, in the old media world, you would have to look at budgets and you know, first it, it'd be a losing battle when you do those comparisons, but if you use your creativity and the skills and the tools that you already have, you can, for a very small amount of money, create a video. But your goal needs to be, as you'll, uh, I think, hear later, um, is how to make a video viral, go viral. There is no cost to that. What there is is there's a lot of smarts and intelligence. And so, you know, it is, it, it's maybe not the right way to frame it is how do we catch up it's more of how to use the tools and your creativity to use the resources. And again, let me push this ROI. In this day and age, $25,000, if you have that as a budget, is a lot of money to be able to move people on the web. And again, it goes back to the issue of engagement. If you can get people to be engaged via email campaigns, I, and also, you know, I, th I thought it was interesting, we, we kind of moved through that fairly quickly. But if 20 million Americans are in college at this point in time, you're reaching, what, 10%, maybe a, a little less than 10% of the American public already. You have them for hours at your institution. Talk about engagement. Same with museums, 850 million visits a year. So most of America during the year is going into a museum and being engaged on some level. Businesses look at those numbers and they go, we wish we had that. Believe me, Target, any of those mass retailers don't get that kind of engagement. You have it. You know, be very resourceful about it. And then last but not least on those cell phones where we showed your reputation. You do, and I know it, it's hard because sometimes you feel like you're not being heard, but you are respected, much more so than the other professions, and a lot of it because other professions don't have the discussions that you have about integrity and truth. You have that going for you. Um, and so that is some, a reason you're going to, to, to be heard. I'm not suggesting by any means you let go of those. But at the same time, the, the word now, the operating word in business is amplification. So my, my counsel is amplify your message. Don't necessarily look at it as, oh, we don't have budget, things like that. Use your tools, be interactive, and make sure the public's hearing your point of view. All right, and we have a question here in the front. Hi, I'm Tom Zipovitz uh, from Food and Drug Administration. Um, I'm on the food side. Uh, and also I'm involved in communication of science. And uh, FDA is, uh, we, we consider FDA a science-driven regulatory agency. And so when people want to know what's in their food or something like that, it is our goal to give them a scientific answer. So we're on the, we're, we're the calmed, reasoned, uh, non-threatening, uh, you know, but also long-winded group of people that, uh, that explains science. And ours, ours, our message can be subverted by three words catchphrases. Uh, 
Uh, I heard one today which doesn't have anything to do with us, but someone said the Vietnam syndrome, okay? And that struck off a whole bunch of things. All you have to say is GMO, BPA, and that elicits reactions in people which totally negate our, you know, whatever message that we're trying to say, which takes a lot longer to express. And so my question to you, since you're, you, uh, you're working with business, and business wants a fast way of set, you know, getting information and, and, and ideas in people's heads, what, what, what chance do we have against, uh, you know, against that, th those powerful tools when, we're, when we have to make uh, these very long explanations about science? Great question. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is. I'll, uh, I've wrestled with this one for uh, a long time. Science is stuck speaking probabilistically. Right? It's, it's about uh, probabilities, and people don't usually understand what that means. Uh, and so in, in that context, the, the hot verbs, the hot adverbs, uh, are left to the people making the three, uh, uh, the, 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 the catchphrases, or um, there are, uh, the, there's a news channel that briefs its people for the 24, I think that, that by now, I think they all do it, but I don't know that for sure. But they brief uh, uh, each other on what the, the issues are of the day and how they're going to cycle those through the... Um, so, uh, you know, wh whether or not... It, it, we were talking about this last night. Um, wh wh whether or not science can really do the science communication, I I'm not fully convinced um, that, that to fight that kind of battle and I don't know where the money's going to come from. I mean, I do look at, oh, a billion people a day. If you're able to figure out how to get a penny out of each one of those, after a while it adds up. Uh, that, that uh, I mean, speaking playfully, but, but uh, it, it may be that to take on, uh, so Climate Central, uh, I, I think Heidi Cullen is here or will be here, that um, uh, is an example of something that can do things and, and potentially say things uh, that uh, the, the NAS uh, or the FDA may not be able to. And so I think as a follow-up, we got another question um, from the web at, before we go to the person asking a question in the back of the audience here, is what we need public-private partnerships for science communication, and, and how do you think that would work? Uh, take that. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, a, a little bit of what, what Davis was just saying is, I'm not sure science communicators can do it on their own, um, because there are competing voices out there. Uh, the, the, probably the worst thing you can hear, and actually Dr. Jameson mentioned this a bit in her presentation, which I, I was very, very impressed with, because I, I think it, it talks in a lot of the language that we're talking about. Not only, you know, I think Davis and I are talking mo a little more about the public, but if you want to make sure the agenda is heard, it's, it's the, you know, the influencer community that is more likely to want to hear. And things like fact checking and things like that, it does get hurt. People do seek out the truth. Um, but when you really get, get down to um, trying to get your, your message heard, it's... Um, let me see, where was I? What was it? of the public-private, um, is that if you can collaborate with these companies, they, they believe me, I've worked with them for, for 30 years, there is very little evil about them. They've got a different mission, it's a different community, they've got different objectives. They do want to do what's right. And they're very receptive to um, truth, to scientific evidence. They need you just as much as you need them. And so anything you can do when you're sharing your research, bring it to them. They'll listen. They will listen. They're curious about it, and they want to know. I mean, they're as curious as any, you know, group in, in America or in the world. They have to. They have to compete that way. So things that are new, they will listen to. So I think it is a very good suggestion. I mean, you have to work with the different communities, whether it's government or it's uh, NGOs or with business. And I think those partnerships are more likely to help people understand scientific evidence than going at, on your own. And I, I, I promise we'll get to you in the back in just a moment, but I have, to, I have to ask, I mean, do you not feel like there is an issue there with transparency when you're dealing with 
a profit motive. I mean, by definition, in the scientific community, there is no profit motive involved. And so that there's not a difficulty wrapping your head around whether or not there are ethical issues there. But any time a profit motive invo is involved, is that not going to lose the public trust? Well, I, I think the, the, the hottest word these days, uh, and I do a lot of work with, uh, with banks, and, th and that is transparency. They get it. They get that they have to be transparent. And you know what's changed about transparency? What's dramatically changed about it? Again, social media. If a game is played, it goes out on social media, whether it's in the blogosphere or somewhere, and people get caught. So the, the need to be truthful, to be transparent, has taken on a whole different dimension. And so you can see it. And you know, it's interesting, again, businesses track this. They do track the importance of being socially responsible. They know that they have to make sure their reputation is good with the audiences they want to reach, and they know that a lot of that has to do with transparency and trust. And so again, they, they want to go there. Now they, again, there's competing interests, but they also know that truth in the room is a very powerful concept. Which hey, is, oh, excuse me, which so is sorry, not to say that you should uh, just take it on faith that people are going to, they have money that they don't have their uh, self-interest. And we have to be very cautious. And I think particularly the academies, uh, more so than anybody, uh, need to be very cautious uh, about that. Because if, it, if, if they're called into question, uh, then uh, we, we could lose a, uh, you know, a national institution that really serves the world. I want to thank you for your patience there in the back. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Lee Herring. Uh, I've been an advocate for behavioral and social science for 30 years here in the Washington area. And um, I just want to thank you as members of the business community for uh, alluding to the value of uh, social and behavioral science in your work um, and also talking about it in this domain of maintaining transparency because that's important to the academic community and the research community. But um, there have been a lot of calls uh, by policymakers of of recent days to eliminate uh, the social sciences in terms of uh, federal funding for those sciences. Many of these sciences, of course, producing some of the very basic fundamental work that we've learned about from Baruch Fishoff and others here at this seminar, uh, work that's critical to uh, future success in increasing ROI, both of the business community, but also of the scientific community. There is ROI to them as well in terms of credibility, being able to communicate. So I just want to Thank you for that. There needs to be more of that. There needs to be more defense by the business community of things like the American Community Survey, for example, and how valuable it is. But um, I just would, so my question is, how do, you, how do you see proceeding, besides being engaged like you are with the academies uh, of the community, the business community, saying more positive things to policymakers in a way that communicates the real message, which is there's value there. Don't, don't be cutting off the, the golden goose here. Can I ask one thing? I uh, appreciate your question. I think there were a number of things that you asked. Is there one thing we can address? <laughs> okay. No, it's just a serious okay. question. I, I All liked, right, yes, I liked everything yes. You what said. are you doing relative to policymakers who count here in Washington right. to, to bring the message that social science, behavioral science, are real sciences, they're very valuable, and you've got to understand human behavior. It's a part of nature, whether you like it or not. Got it. So uh, this question is above my pay grade. Um, but, but I will give you an example that I've seen have some meaning. So um, uh, at Stanford for the um, Center for the Advanced Study of the Behavioral Sciences, um, uh, Steve Koslin, who came from Harvard and was, was running that, uh, has gone off to entrepreneurial ways at the moment. But that uh, uh, one of the ways Steve uh, addressed that um, uh, issue was to hold a conference now, and it just, they had their second one at Stanford this year, where it, it was, here are the behavioral sciences, and here's what's happening with them. Here's how people are applying it. Here's how, uh, here's, the, here's the latest uh, across the behavioral sciences, but how is it showing up meaningfully in people's lives? So that, that was a, that's at least an example uh, of, um, uh, that, that everybody came out of that, well, I can't speak to everyone, but, but there was a, 
the, the, the forms and the feedback basically, um, uh, it, it was drawing people from a wide variety of, of uh, communities, so not just the academic or the entrepreneurial community, but it was, it was bringing in uh, uh, people from governments and, and NGOs. So there's a question um, that came in from the web here that I think is probably, in my opinion, one of the more important questions to ask, which is that so much of the challenge of communicating science messages seems tied up in imparting an understanding and acceptance of the scientific method itself, of the process of science, not so much the outcomes of science. So what techniques would you guys recommend be used for that express purpose? <laughs> Stumped. Th there are so many more people qualified in this building to answer that question than, than the likes of us. Um, but uh, me personally, I'll, I'll give you my shot at it. So I'm, I'm involved heavily, while I believe in citizen science, I think it's mostly funded from the top down. I like bottoms up things as well. The quantified self, uh, you may or may not have heard of, but uh, the quantified self is people measuring aspects of their of themselves. Could be their biome, it could be their blood pressure, it could be their steps or the amount of sleep, uh, could be their, uh, you can do an EKG off your iPhone now. I mean, there's so many different things that are going on. And I'm, I chair the advisory group uh, uh, to, to, to the group, uh, Quantified Self Labs, in the middle of this, I, I help stir the pot. And that's now going on in 30 some odd countries where people are pretty regularly meeting on, uh, on these issues. Well, this is about getting uh, data that's relevant about people around issues of their own concern, if that makes any sense. That, that people are starting to measure things out of their own interests. Uh, and in that context, uh, they then show it to, I showed Peter, I talked to him about some of my data. And then uh, uh, he was kind of interested. Well, there are entrepreneurs all, and scientists, um, and uh, uh, around the world who are developing these tools, uh, and they're getting picked up by more and more people. So I think the scientific method, my, my approach to that, is that via citizen science and the movement of the smartphone and things along those lines, and the quantified self, that people out of their own curiosity are going to be able to make better choices in their world because they're using the scientific method, although they may not know that they're using the scientific method. And, and just real quickly to add to that, um, that is about engagement. Because it's one thing to impart knowledge, it's another thing to engage people. And things like a lot of these Fitbits and uh, you know, the up jawbone, it is getting people engaged in data, in their day-to-day -day life. And the more they're engaged, their head goes there, their time goes there, their passion goes there, and that's really the way to communicate the scientific method is through evidence and through data. So I think you know, a bottoms up is much more powerful these days than someone saying, hey, look, we're right, you know, we're wrong type of an approach. Do we have a question right here in the center? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Nicole Langley. I'm with The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm a relationship manager for the industry liaison office, so we help to bring together business and industry to um, researchers to build collaborations. So I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm also a student in strategic communications at OSU. And um, my question actually, the earlier dialogue was a great segue to it because my background is in private business and then also government and now academic, um, it's no secret that the federal dollars are going away. And so what we try to do is, where you mentioned earlier, um, take your research to the business. What we try to do is build the collaboration to begin with. So my question is, why are science communication and commercial communication mutually exclusive? And, you know, maybe you answered a good portion of this question, but can you suggest maybe an elevator talk on um, how they can be more collaborative instead of competitive? So I'll take the first shot at that. I personally don't 
think, if, if we've left you the impression that we think bad, business is the bad guys and they're outspending everybody and science is just a little rowboat on the ocean and it's getting tossed around by the tides and, of business. Okay, well, that's partially true. Um, but, but, but uh, there, there are things that um, uh, science can... Um, uh, that, that, that science can do in cooperation uh, with, with, uh, uh, with businesses. And I've lost my point, so off of my little <laughs> rowboat, apologies. Yeah, and, and just to add quickly to that, uh, I think the old model is the competitiveness that if business is involved with science, that it might contaminate uh, what, what scientists are doing. And, and I, I truly understand that because you don't want profit motives or other motives that aren't in line with scientific goals. At, at the same time, my concern, and, and Davis too, is that science is being outmaneuvered. And it really is time to have new relationships with maybe some of the old foes. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear some of the earlier speakers talk about that and talk about how that, that collaborative outlook could be the best hope that science gets heard and embraced by the American public. Because again, we're very concerned um, that your voice is actually becoming a lesser and lesser um, voice in the American public. It, it, you know, we all know science has become politicized. And watching that through my career has been you know, very, very upsetting. And I don't see that changing. I really don't. And just to show you, it's not fully Alzheimer's in my case, <laughs> that um, uh, in, in terms of, uh, we're not trying to have an anti-business, uh, pro-science kind of conversation. It's just the amount of noise that's out there. When there's a trillion dollars in noise, and you have a whisper, you ought to be aware that all you have is a whisper, and that there are ways to play um, uh, that can be... Uh, Affected, and there's such a wide variety of the experiments that are going on here and at the AAAS and at colleges and universities all around the uh, the nation. So I I think there are all sorts of uh, uh, examples about how these things can can work well together. All right, we have one more question down here in the front, and if we could keep it brief. Oh, right here, he's raising his hand. <laughs> One thing that I haven't heard uh, people talk about, but it's become very popular in linking science with business, are challenges. So uh, NASA, for instance, had a problem with the International Space Station that they couldn't solve. So they broke it down into challenges that people could solve different parts of it. And these uh, NIVEA is using it, at, at a lot of the big industries, Goodyear, uh, are using these challenges. Uh, it's a form of crowdsourcing, but the people who answer the challenges are often retirees who actually know a lot about that type of problem and do solve the problem. So I think these types of challenges are a way of uh, getting science uh, in the public, in, uh, the public doing science and also business finding out things as well. I think that's a great example. Another one here from the, from the academies, I think, is the Science and Entertainment Exchange. I mean, there have been over 700 consultations between the scientific community and the people who drive story in Hollywood. And it's, it's, it's hard to measure specifically, but 700 consultations is a, is a big number. And I know that we are almost out of time. We've got 30 seconds left. But you did want to address a question that came in from the audience about the proportion. Do you have any advice for the proportion of research dollars that should go towards outreach versus actual um, bench work? Yeah. Um, does everyone get that question, is how much should you allocate from a grant or from a budget? Uh, and that's something that businesses grapple with. Uh, but it's interesting. If you look at the numbers that I showed you, if uh, if, it, if about $10 billion is being spent, you can actually do that math and, on research and, and say, you know, about, well, on research, it's 1%. Um, on communication, on being really smart about it, uh, our suggestion is 2 to 5% uh, should be spent. And it depends, you know, it depends on how radical what you're trying to do or how many people you're trying to reach. Um, but a few percent 
makes an awful lot of sense to, to allocate or dedicate to effective communication. And, and one other, I, I understand, one other <laughs> quick thing. So someone like Peter, uh, people have spent maybe a quarter billion dollars with him on researching things. The amount of money that's out there on the business side to solve problems and drive profits and all of that kind of stuff are, are enormous. And the amount of expertise that's available, uh, like on the symbols uh, that, that we looked at with the half plate, well, th there may be people out there who are happy to help collaborate with, uh, uh, on that with you. Uh, you don't, I wouldn't take it to the final step that they have some say, with, that the FDA, that shouldn't be about influencing the FDA. It ought to be that there, there are people out researching this stuff with enormous budgets uh, and, uh, and, and, most, uh, and, and will give the scientists a run for their money. So.